On behalf of the NYU Aging Incubator, I would like to welcome you to this, um, our second of three speaker events featuring Tisch faculty. We are delighted that you are all here with us today and we thank you very much for your participation. For those of you who are new to the Aging Incubator, the NYU Aging Incubator is a do interdisciplinary university-wide partnership across the NYU schools that was established early in 2017. It brings together faculty and students from all disciplines who are involved in the study of aging and we hope to also introduce the concept of the importance of aging to individuals who may not have thought about this as a topic. The Aging Incubator seeks to facilitate initiation of pathbreaking interdisciplinary research, programs, and educational endeavors to improve and enhance the day-to-day -day lives of older adults and address the challenges that we are all facing living in an aging society. The incubator is led by three co-directors, Joshua Chodosh from the School of Medicine, Bei Wu from uh, the Myers College of Nursing, and myself um, from the College of Dentistry and Public Health. Um, we also uh, have um, Dean Ellen Mar uh, Mark Sullivan, who is the provost liaison to the aging incubator. So jointly we share leadership, expertise, and a broad range of interests and diverse professional interests. With our partnership with the School of Tisch School of the Arts on our faculty series, um, a speaker series, we hope that we will facilitate conversations that highlight aging from different perspectives, break down stereotypes of what it means to age, and showcase the value and opportunity of an extended lifespan, and provide also the concept of a research and career avenue for students who are interested in this area. Um, now I am pleased to introduce with you today um, Karen Nesessian, who will introduce our guest of honor. Uh, Karen is the Associate Vice Provost of Strategy and Chief of Staff to the Provost, and she oversees the Provost Strategic Initiatives and Priorities, and she's been incredibly supportive in helping us establish and promote the NYU Aging Incubator and the facilitation of cross-school initiatives and connections. Welcome, Karen. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Vicky, for that kind introduction. Um, my name is Karen Nersessian. Um, I am the Chief of Staff for the Provost, and I handle um, the strategic initiatives that she dabbles with. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today participating in the speaker series event. This is my second one, and um, I'm, I'm truly excited to be here. Um, Catherine Fleming is our provost, and she's very supportive of the NYU Aging Incubator and this, seri and this series event. Um, it is a cross-disciplinary approach to research and programming. Um, NYU has such a wide and diverse and global population with incredible skill sets, as we know. Uh, that when combined, innovative, unique, and profound conversations and solutions can be achieved. I'm honored to be introducing John Canemaker and John Gartenberg today. Uh, as Vicky said, the speaker series will facilitate conversations that highlight aging from different perspectives, and today, John and John will be exploring John's personal perspective on aging. John Canemaker is a tenured professor at NYU Tisch School of the Arts where he began teaching animation in 1980 and where he has directed the animation program since 1988. John, a much loved and revered NYU academic, uh, was a 2009 recipient of NYU's Distinguished Teaching Award of Exceptional Teaching Inside and Outside the Classroom. He's, internationally he's an internationally recognized animator, author, teacher, and animation historian. John won a 2005 Oscar and a 2006 Emmy Award for his 28-minute animated short, The Moon and the Sun, an imagined conversation, which we will be seeing today. His personal films are part of the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. John Canemaker has written 12 books on animation history that are among the most important and thoroughly researched in the field, as well as numerous articles, reviews, and interviews for major print and electronic media. Asking John the questions is John Gartenberg, who is the president of Gartenberg Media Enterprises, a company that is dedicated to archiving, distributing, and programming collections of moving, imaging, moving image works. 
John was previously a curator at MoMA's film department where he worked on the restoration of films ranging from D.W. Griffith to Andy Warhol. Following that, he worked at Broadway Video Entertainment where he oversaw a project to digitize and internationally distribute the television animation series, Underdog. His career path then led him to the Golden Books family entertainment where he collaborated on a project to republish the Little Golden Books, many of which contained original drawings by famous Disney artists. More recently, John programmed experimental films for the Tribeca Film Festival, where he created a retrospective of John Painmaker's um, films. John is also a proud NYU um, Tisch alum, having obtained his master's degree from NYU's Department of Cinema Studies. These two remarkable speakers are both fascinating people and we're all in for a real treat today. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming John Canemaker and John Garfinger. I think we'll keep it a little informal. Um, okay. Yeah, let's keep it informal. <laughs> um, so, uh, I just want to tell you what the course of this afternoon will be. Uh, we're just going to do some brief intros. We're going to screen uh, The Moon and the Sun. And John and I are going to have a conversation. And then we're going to have time for a question and answer. So just as a starting point, uh, I wanted to say that in thinking about what film would be best to show, we uh, thought of the idea of showing some clips and excerpts from John's film. But uh, I felt, and John completely agreed, that it's very important to show an artist's complete work. So it's the whole thought process and creative process from the beginning and end. And I think you will see from this film that in terms of the subject of aging and also intergenerational issues about aging, that this film is uh, perfectly uh, suited. So without further ado, I'd just like to ask John if you want to say a few words before we see the film. Uh, thank you, John. Um, it's amazing how many people you can get in a room when it's cold outside, isn't it? <laughs> I'm so happy you're here, and I'm delighted to be here and honored by this uh, this uh, afternoon uh, dealing with the uh, aging incubator. Uh, so thank you for inviting me, and thank you for hosting this, John. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in 28 minutes. Don't go outside. I know what happens in the film, so <laughs> I'm uh, I'll be here later. Thank you. Can you hear both of us? Can you see both of us? <laughs> um, so I wanted to start off this conversation, um, first of all, by saying that uh, I made movies when I was in college, and they were terrible. And uh, they're stored in my archives, and nobody will ever uh, find them. <laughs> um, but as an archivist and curator working for 20 years at MoMA and then in my own career evolution since then, um, I've really come to appreciate in a very deep way uh, how, uh, how brave it is, um, it's okay, how, uh, what a brave film uh, th that you made. And um, I think often people don't realize that artists like you who work independently you're putting your heart and soul and all of those things that you feel inside of you on the screen. And I think it's a very brave gesture and I'd just like to thank you for that. Um, so we want to explore this notion of aging uh, and in a way to cut against the whole idea of aging by looking at the uh, idea of aging through the lens of artistic creativity. Um, and when I worked at MoMA, uh, one of the things I learned, because it was the Museum of Modern Art, is that uh, art is about uh, painting and sculpture, but also film is about uh, the articulation and expression of time and space. 
And what I've layered onto that with film in my lifelong experience is also the idea of memory. And I think that this film, as you could readily see, sort of encapsulates uh, all of those concepts together. So in talking about creativity, um, I just wanted to start with sort of what inspired you at the beginning when you were growing up. You alluded a little bit to this in the film, but we talked a little more about it before we, uh, before we met here, and I think it, it's a good starting point. Well, um, I was mentioning that uh, <coughs> so much of what my life became uh, started really in the first 18 years when I was uh, growing up in Elmira, New York, a very small town. There were no animation schools then. There was, uh, we were a, a rather poor family. None of the, my relatives have ever gone to college before me. Um, so the the um, the influences came from other other sources. Um, there was a little art store in town, and uh, the owner's assistant had a couple of books on animation. And he gave them to me. I still have them, and they were just like uh, uh, a gold mine of information at that time. Um, there was the Disneyland TV show. I don't know if, well, some of you may remember it, but it was on in the 1950s, and it often showed how animation was created. Uncle Walt would show us how to make a move. Uh, and then there was the other Uncle Walt, Walter Lance, who had the Woody Woodpecker show. They also showed you how to animate. You could create your own flip books and stuff like that. So that was another uh, source. Interestingly enough, too, because I, I am an animation historian now, um, back then on the Disneyland show, they did a big show on the history of animation. And my first film, <laughs> I copied everything I could from that Disneyland TV show and did some animation within it. So it was a documentary with animation. I mean, it's incredible how everything is just sort of circular, going back to the earliest uh, days. Um, I was also mentioning that an early influence, well, not that early, but in the 1960s, I was drafted into the Army. And although that, uh, that wouldn't seem to be uh, connected to this in any way, as a teacher, I find it uh, incredibly um, helpful uh, it was a very disciplined uh, uh, time to be in the Army at that time. It was the beginning of the Vietnam War, and I was lucky enough not to serve overseas, but I served at Fort Dix for two years. But the discipline of having to get up, having a duty to do, uh, uh, having a purpose, finding the energy to do it when you didn't really want to do it, uh, it's something that always stayed with me, and it helped me through a, uh, a lot of stuff, trying to get films done and trying to... Uh, juggle what became a three-tiered career of teaching and writing and and making films at the same time. So um, these strange uh, influences always were with me. And uh, can you talk a little more also about uh, how you sort of moved yourself forward from being in Elmira in terms of following your inspiration and how that developed a little bit? Well, I've always had this sort of inner inner voice of reason uh, when things are going haywire outside, there's some, some core of me that says this would be the right thing to do. And that time, the, the voice said, uh, get out of town. <laughs> get out of Elmira. No college education, no money. I came to New York. My parents dropped me off at 63rd Street at the Y uh, in 1961 with $60 in my pocket. And uh, uh, I was going to be studying to be an actor. I thought that's how I will fool the public. I will be an actor. So I got into the American Academy of Dramatic Arts <laughs> in 1961 and uh, got a job right away as a doorman at Radio City Music Hall. And again, you know, uh, making $30 a week, going to school, trying to keep it together. It was, it was interesting. I had no idea where I was going to go, what I was going to do. I put animation aside. Never got back to that until after the Army. You have the GI Bill, um, you know, and, and uh, um, was able to put myself through, uh, through college by doing TV commercials as an actor, as a performer, a clown, basically. 
Um, but somehow in the back of my mind, the animation was always there. And when I went to college, when I was 30, uh, it was at Marymount Manhattan here in New York, and there was a nun there who took an interest, Sister Dimphna Leonard. And she said, you used to do this animation stuff, didn't you? And I said, yes. Yeah. Why don't you do it anymore? And I said, well, I'm an actor. I'm doing commercials and going to college. And, uh, she said, well, I'll give you six credits if you go to the Disney studio this summer of 73. They've opened an archive there. You write a paper on Disney animation, I'll give you six credits. I could graduate early. So I did. She wrote a letter. I wrote a letter. I went out that summer, and uh, I, I met all the, the great animators that I'd seen on television on the Disneyland show in the 50s. It was, you know, here's this circular thing happening uh, again or beginning. Uh, and uh, came back, wrote the paper, started to spin off articles. That led to my becoming an animation editor at Millimeter Magazine. That led to uh, my first book contract when I graduated from Marymount and then Dimphna said what are you going to do now? I said well I'll uh, be an actor I'm going back in the head and she said <laughs> why don't you consider graduate school is uh, you know go to uh, NYU they have a film program there and um, you know you used to do this animation stuff. She had encouraged me to while I was going to Marymount take an evening course at the School of Visual Arts and to make an animated film you know, so I did. There was that thing I had made that I stole everything from Disney <laughs> back in Elmira, but now this was a, a little film that I had made on my own at School of Visual Arts. It got me into NYU. And then to make money from that, I started teaching, and then I had my first book contract, and I don't know. I don't know how I got here, frankly. I'm, uh, I'm lucky to be alive, <laughs> you know? Really, it's uh, serendipitous. Great. Um, so I wanted to also then, I think this is a good lead-in to this idea, and we discussed this earlier. I mean, here's a white piece of paper, and Mallarmé, the French symbolist poet, has written about the whole difficulty of an artist or a poet having confronted with this and having to uh, put the words to the page. And when we were having lunch, I was struck by this incredible word you used, which I thought was also incredibly brave and honest. You talked about the quote unquote terror of being confronted with a blank page. And I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Well, I think every artist uh, can relate to this. It doesn't have to be the, the blank page. It can be bl the blank sculpture, the, uh, you know, the, the blank dance that hasn't happened yet. Um, but in my case, because I deal with paper animation or hand-drawn animation and because also there are pixels that are involved, it's it's the ch same challenge. It's the challenge of what do you do now? How do you proceed from here? Um, I was talking about this yesterday with my storyboarding boarding students here at, at NYU, and they're facing it. They have a literary property, but how do you visualize it? Here's the blank page again. Well, you start where you can. Uh, for example, for storyboards, uh, I asked a great Disney animator, uh, a, a story artist, how do you get started? He said, uh, well, if you have a book called The Be Beauty and the Beast, you dream into the title. I thought that was a great phrase, dream into the title. Grab onto whatever you can in, in terms of the subject matter. Um, if there's a script, that's very helpful, but it might be just the title. It might be a, a, a subject. Start to do research. Start to uh, strengthen your imagination. It's a muscle that needs to be uh, you know, strengthened, not ju just flying by it seat of its pants. These are strange metaphors for, for brains and things. But um, <laughs> uh, that's, you know, that's how you overcome your fear of it. Because if, you know, I, I was uh, encouraged to draw for relatives and things like that, but there was no real uh, basis back when I, I grew up in terms of uh, serious application of, of art principles and things. Those I, I came upon later. And uh, and I'm still learning them. You learn every, every day. Uh, someone said, uh, be careful because you might learn something new every day if you're not careful. So. Um, I also then wanted to uh, uh, turn a little bit because 
I'm sure we're going to get the inevitable questions about the Academy Award and uh, the moon and the sun. And here I also think it's very significant to talk about uh, you as an uh, individual and as an animator and your work with hand-drawn animation as the world was converting to digital. Mm -hmm. and I think that's very important in terms of this notion of creativity and self-confidence and knowledge of yourself to keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So if you could talk a little bit about that experience in terms of what films you were up against and, and, and your reaction to the whole uh, thing when they announced your name. Well, uh, it was not just my name, but it was also Peggy Stern's name, and she's here. Now she was the wonderful producer of the film. Peggy, say hi. <laughs> and the associate producer is my husband, Joe Kennedy, was there. And, uh, and Zoya wasn't there, but she worked on the film. So thank you. Um, well, it was, of course, a great disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> we hated every minute of being there and seeing Dolly Parton on the red carpet. You know, stuff like that. You see it every day. Um, no, it was, <laughs> it was what you expected. It was, it was quite, uh, quite wonderful. I won't say it was magical, but it was, uh, it was something that uh, we thought we would never win. Uh, we were up against Pixar. Who else? There were a lot of uh, people, you know, both from this country and other, other countries. And I, oh, God, that stuff is great. You know, we're just a little hand-drawn film. But it's nice to be here. And uh, we walked the carpet. In fact, we walked the carpet twice because nobody would talk to us. We would just uh, <laughs> go by, <laughs> you know, and you're, you're walking by. And, and uh, the two publicists from, PB, uh, from HBO, which helped finance the film, are saying, uh, okay, we're going to go ahead. I mean, they're passing out things about it. There, they, here they are, the, you know, s short film animation. And they're <laughs> <laughs> going like that. And even jo I remember Joan Rivers. They were saying <laughs> to Joan Rivers, she was having doing her makeup over here. And they said, Joan, Joan animators, animators. She went, <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Um, so we went by twice because maybe twice is the charm. Well, it wasn't. Anyway, uh, um, I met a couple of people, uh, Robert Osborne I knew and, and Leonard Moulton. They were nice. <laughs> but then we were ushered into our seats. The minute I got into the theater, it was like this. You think it's large on the screen? It's not. It's a TV studio. It's, you know, I felt very familiar because I'd done a lot of commercials and stuff. So I, oh, no. But the thing was that Peggy and I were smart enough to rehearse our speech just in case. See, we were optimists. And uh, uh, so we wrote down our little speeches for each of us. And then Joe would uh, say, okay, because you had one minute from going from the audience, that's, they give you a little video and they say, you have one minute to get up and then you have to make the speech. Otherwise, the music comes up. So... Joe would say, okay, go. Peggy and I would run across the hotel, uh, you know, uh, room, <laughs> pick, up, pick up an ashtray or a Coke can, and then we tried to do our speech, and we screwed it up every time. Screwed it up. and said, well, we're never going to win anyway. So we win, and that's the first time the speech clicked in. <laughs> so I don't know what that means, but uh, that's what happened. And uh, th then we have to tell one more thing about oh, sure. it. It's probably boring, but uh, the, m the magic of it takes place after you win the thing. You go backstage, and you're ushered back. And I knew the woman who was ushering us back. She was a publicist. And, uh, and you're in the dark, and they're guiding you through the dark of this labyrinth in the back. And everywhere you go, you're whispering, congratulations, congratulations, wonderful, congratulations, oh, good, congratulations, congratulations, all the way through. And then up in the elevator, congratulations, congratulations. <laughs> and then you get up to the where the, they're going to take more pictures, and they push you out into this thing, and congratulations, and then bam, all of these lights hit you, and they're smash, you know, taking smash photographs of you. And then they're saying, are there any questions for the two animators? <laughs> <laughs> Crickets, crickets, crickets. <laughs> Finally, one person who wrote for an animation took pity on us and asked some question, and uh, we grudgingly gave an answer. So there. <laughs> Those are great stories. Mm. Um, so I wanted to move on to an, another uh, related topic, which is that in my experience, especially these days, the culture tends to pigeonhole people. This person is, you know, a... Uh, doctor or this person is a writer or whatever that single term may be. And I think like in terms of the con concept of aging and creativity, 
that really s s negates the idea. It's sort of looking, it negates the idea of what's in your heart and mind and ideas and how they can be expressed. So some people may call you, oh, John's an animator, mm -hmm. you know, but in a way that also pigeons hole you because you're not just an animator. I mean, your private life, you're much more than that. But in your creative life, you're much more than that. And so we've discussed some of these things and some you've alluded to, being a filmmaker, a writer, a teacher, an actor. And so I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about this concept of what's in your head or your heart or your mind and how those can get expressed in different forms which are also manifestations of your creativity. And just in case you want any props, uh. I have a couple of these things. Why, what's this? <laughs> In my, some of my articles from um, the Times and the Wall Street Journal and stuff. Um, I, I consider myself very lucky because I've made my avocation my vocation. And I love animation, and everything I do is re revolves around it. You know, I, I make films. I teach how to make films or advise people on making films. I don't think you really teach my students. There's one over there, very smart. Um, they they're just waiting for information or to give you the uh, 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 help give them a push, um, and uh, um, so I I I just think uh, I've never wanted to be pigeonholed. Uh, I mean I know people do, and they do in the business, but uh, I, I'm so glad I didn't work for a big studio. Finally, you know it was a dream to be part of Disney when I was a kid, but when it didn't happen and other things did. It was great to be an independent because then I could do all these different things and uh, uh, fine if they want to think of me one day as an animator, fine. Next day as a as a writer, that's good too. And uh, as long as I can keep doing them, as long as I do enough quality work so that you know uh, I don't want them to think he's a bum, that he, <laughs> you know, that would be the worst, the worst thing. So um, uh, I just think um, I never wanted to be bossed. I always wanted to be the boss. So when I opened my own uh, studio, which was when I got the world according to Garp, there was a budget that was big enough, and uh, you know um, allowed me to um, to open my own studio. And then I I somehow gained a reputation in New York for doing animation, but of serious subjects. I've done films on child abuse. Um, I've done films on um, uh, teen suicide on children with cancer. Uh, that was for HBO. It won an Oscar for uh, the producer there. The um, child abuse was called Kids Against Child Abuse. It was a CBS special. It won a Peabody. So uh, I've been very lucky, I think, to do these interesting projects in which to take animation, which is pretty much chatto, you know, uh, ghettoized as a child's medium, particularly with animated features in this country, uh, and to be able to do a subject that was um, using animation to tell a different kind of story, I feel quite quite lucky to do that. This is this film was something like that, something of it. But I couldn't have done this film if I hadn't done thirty years of films before that, in which I dealt with those subject matters and and trying to figure it out creatively. You know, who wants to have the cat chase the mouse? I mean, for me, I was interested in. Um, how do you show a kid having chemotherapy and use it, do it as an animated film? Uh, that, that particular thing was uh, where um, childlike drawing of a kid has a, a, a machine with green liquid in it and a tube going in his arm, very childlike drawings um, because it was based on a kid's book explaining the difficulties of having cancer for children. And... Uh, and then when the, when the liquid goes into the kid, he becomes like an empty milk bottle that fills up with the green liquid. And when it gets up to the top, pop, his hairs fly out of his head. And he desperately tries to pick up the hairs and tries to put them on his head. And then he, he cries and runs off the screen. It only lasts a minute, but it's very powerful. And it just is a, a good lesson to, to see that animation can go into the interior of the mind. It can become... It can manifest thought. It can become emotions, as you've seen with Inside Out, you know, that sort of thing. And it can do more than make you laugh. It can make you cry. People cry at some of my films. Don't mean to make them feel bad. 
but it's interesting, <coughs> interesting, and it's always a challenge, you know, always a challenge. Well, I think it's also because you're talking to the human condition, and that's How what is touches he? people. <laughs> <laughs> How is he doing, <laughs> Mr. Kandish? <laughs> I know him as Mr. Kandish. Um, so uh, moving on to another topic related, um, I think it would be good if we could talk a little bit about mentoring, because I think the idea of mentoring cuts against the idea of aging in that you had mentors and you've mentored other people, and so this becomes something of the knowledge of who you learn from and who you've taught, and then it becomes something almost timeless, this art of animation. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, also mentioning the films you've made about animators that were your mentors. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, when I started writing about animation and uh, you know, learning that there were still these pioneers around. I really got in at the last moment when I could actually meet the man who created Felix the Cat. Lived over in New Jersey, Otto Mesmer. So I made a documentary film about him and I wrote about him extensively, became friends. You know, I, uh, that's a very special kind of animation and I don't use it often, but it also relates to what I try to do. It's personality animation, it's, it's uh, simple, simple designs, etc. He was a mentor of sorts. He didn't sit down and you know teach me or such. He was 84 when I met him. But uh, uh, there were a number of Disney artists who, you know, after admiring Fantasia when I was a kid and, uh, and seeing these guys on the Disneyland TV show, I finally got to meet them in 73, and then at least three or four of them became friends. I couldn't believe it. Um, and two of them, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, two of the greatest of of uh, character animators, became uh, mentors, literally mentors. Uh, send us your film, send us a new film. And then there was this tough love thing that they would do. You know, they'd say, well, you did very well with this and da da da, but there's this other part that you really, and you know, they, they helped me, they helped me. And I was so grateful uh, just to know them and to have them take an interest. It really was a, you know, um, more of a, almost a parental thing that, that happened. There was a woman here in New York who was also a great influence on, on not only me, but many of the New York animators, young New York animators in the 1970s. Her name was Tisa David, and uh, she was a Hungarian who had um, come through a lot, uh, from, uh, uh, came over here from Europe in the 1950s, was a wonderful animator who lucked out and got a job with uh, Grim Natwick who was the man who animated a uh, lot of scenes in Snow White for Walt Disney, and he created Betty Boop. So the two of them for 12 years were a partnership uh, here in New York, and they did TV commercials and stuff like that. Well, Tisa was the, the doyenne of, of New York animation, and we all sort of, you know, would go over to her little apartment over on the east side and show her our <coughs> uh, shaky little, uh, you know, drawings and our shaky films, and um, she was, Heartless. She would um, <laughs> she sort of look at them and she said, this, this is a terrible drawing. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, I show her the films and she said, no, it's, it's a terrible film. And then she'd go through and she would then explain to you why she would go through and she would make drawings and stuff. I have a whole bunch of her drawings and uh, she was just uh, revered by us all. I remember one time, if I can just tell a, sure. a quick anecdote. We used w there weren't schools as I mentioned, you know, so we used to we used to rent Disney films, sixteen millimeter films. Don't tell anybody this, but um, maybe this shouldn't be in the documentary. <laughs> but we uh, we um, we would cut out scenes from the <laughs> from the films, and we would run over to a lab over on uh, the eight on the west side and say, "Run it through twice for s for sound." And so he'd run through this little sequence and then we'd have our own copy. And we could study it then, frame by frame. And then we'd put it back to, you know, put the other one, the original back to the film and give it back to the <laughs> rental company. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we also would buy prints that we shouldn't have of certain great films, 60 millimeter prints. $300 you could get Fantasia, something like that. <coughs> so. We had one night. We had a little showing of one of the great films in um, in uh, my apartment, and it was you know an old projector. So you had to change. There were three reels, 
So the whole film would stop in the middle and you'd have to change the reel and then put it up again. But who cared? You know, we're watching this film and Tisa was in the in the in the living room as well. And so <laughs> we finished and there it was. They'd seen this film in my living room and uh, turn to Tisa and say, Huh? Oh, I hate that film. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and if you want to see Tisa, she's on YouTube, and she's being interviewed by me here in at NYU. I brought her, so you'll s you'll see. She was amazing, amazing artist and person. Uh, another concept related to aging, I think, has to do with the word passion. You and I both talked, I think, about how we both feel blessed in a way to pursue what we love, me film also, film history, and from an archivist perspective, mm -hmm. and you as certainly a historian, and significantly also as a creator. And I wonder if you could just talk about this notion of loving what you do and how that can transcend the idea of you're getting older. Yeah, I, I think, uh Passion should be there for everything that you do. Uh, and love certainly translates. Uh, Richard Williams, the great animator, said, uh, love certainly is shown on the screen, meaning what you put into your work uh, comes across on the screen. So um, uh, age has nothing to do with uh, uh, creativity, really. I mean, you mature, you learn things, hopefully, but, um, you know, if you have that basic love, it's going to be there when you're a child, you know, a teenager, middle-aged, uh, uh, or an old person. Um, so um, love what you do and good things come out of it. I do, I do tell my students that. Uh, don't worry about where your career is going to go. Uh, you only have a very short period between that, you know, blank part before you were born and then the blank part that's coming afterwards. Um, so enjoy what you're doing and, and try to be kind to people. They should hear this in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but to do what you want is uh, almost, um, you know, to, to do something that you love. If it's difficult, uh, even, even more, it's, it's, um, it's sort of, uh, um, you know, a political statement in a way. It's uh, it's it's just trying to bring a little something. This is sounding cliche, but something um, wonderful into into the world. Um, and uh, um, the thing that makes everybody's work different is the person themselves. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. There's no new techniques, really. I mean, it's all development of of things that have happened before. There's there's really no new stories. The the thing that's different about it is you. You are the, the thing that makes it different. So I encourage the students to tell their stories. Um, I find people fascinating. I used to, back in Elmira, I used to go to the library and just look up biographies all the time. I love biographies. And I always go down the biography and say, uh, okay, this is when they became who they were supposed to be. Okay, and then I'd go down and, ah, oh, that's when he became Walt Disney. Hmm, okay. <laughs> so. What am I saying? Does this make any sense? Makes a lot of sense, because I think you're also talking in this idea of mentorship. You talked about your mentors, but you have mentored a whole array of students mm -hmm. who've gone on. So I wonder if you could just talk a little about that. Well, um, it's, it's thrilling, you know. Um, from my perspective, I see what they don't see. They, you know, they walk into the classroom and they have a certain idea about themselves, but I know it's not gonna, it's gonna go a different direction, and it's okay. Um, some of our students are at Pixar, some of them are at Disney, they're at big studios, some of them have created their own studios. I'm just enormously proud at, uh, at uh, what we've accomplished. The uh, Caldecott, uh, children's book illustrators, uh, winners of the Caldecott. Um, uh, musicians, just rock musicians who are animators, great puppet <laughs> animators became a rock. I'm talking about Tundi Adebempe. Uh, he's, uh, he's someone uh, that was an animator here. 
And we have the parents here of um, one of our most recent triumphs, a uh, young man named Aiden Terry, uh, who graduated about a year ago and within that year has become the assistant to uh, Glenn Keane, one of the great Disney animators. He animated the Beast and Beauty and the Beast and uh, Pocahontas and the Little Mermaid. He was he was it for 30 years at Disney. He hired Aiden to be his assistant on Dear Basketball, which has just been nominated for an Academy Award. So we're very proud of, of Aiden, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, he's a, a marvelous kid, not only a terrific animator and drafts person, but uh, a, a person, a real person. So there we are. And one of my former students is, is, uh, is a teacher here now and is also a marvelous filmmaker in her own, uh, her, her own right, Zoya Baker. She is a, a marvelous teacher, teaches the intro to animation class, and uh, uh, she is a, uh, a marvelous filmmaker of, uh, of documentaries and, and uh, a, a technical technical person who's working with me on some projects as well. So there we are. And, and it just made me think of another thing as we were talking that connects us again because I think we met, what was it, 40 years ago, something <laughs> like that? Yes. Even though we both, I think, look we a little were, younger yeah, we than we may <laughs> short pants seem. And, yeah. But uh, my mommy brought me to a school. Yeah. And I think that that experience <laughs> of acquiring your, <laughs> you're a very good actor too. Um, the experience of acquiring your films for MoMA's collection, permanent collection, That's is also you. another way, well I meant more importantly though for me as an archivist, it's another way to perpetuate the memory because those films long past you're gone and long past I'm gone, there are these artifacts that can be screened again and your work can become alive. Yeah. And so I think that's another way that we're talking about ways to transcend this whole notion of age, aging mm -hmm. in terms of kind of creative continuity. Mm -hmm. We're after immortality here. That's what we're, we're looking for. So the just very last thing to quote, I don't know if you had any of those quotes you wanted. Oh, or? there was one quote. Yes, yes I think um, that this was. Uh, this is the moment for the quote. There's a wonderful uh, writer named Harriet Dorr. Does anyone know her, her work? Well, she wrote very small, very few things. She died in 2001 at the age of 92. And she published her first novel in 1984 at the age of 73. Okay, aging. Uh, exquisite prose is found in her Stones for Iberia, uh, Ibera. Her second novel is called Consider This Senora. And then there is The Tiger in the Grass, which is a third book, a collection of her essays, Harriet Dorr. She believed in no religion, and in uh, uh, Consider This, which is, no, which is her book of uh, essays, a woman, uh, a widow named Ursula Bowles, enters the story at age 70 and exits at 83, and she observes life's evanescence. And here's the quote. She could see that an individual's life is in the end, nothing more than a stirring of air, a shifting of light. No one of us finally can be more than that, even Einstein, even Brahms." Unquote. So with that uh, shifting of air, shifting of air <laughs> we have time for a few questions. I think that they're going to have a microphone. Is that correct? There's going to be a microphone, so uh, if you have a question, please uh, allow them time to bring you the microphone so this can be recorded. And so I encourage you all, I mean, we've been chatting a while here. I'm sure there's some questions or ideas that have come into your heads, so please feel free and comfortable, even if it's not a fully formed question, to ask something. I have a question and I have a proposition. So the question is, um, did your own maturing and aging, which is not a dirty word, no. um, give you some better perspective of your father. Mm. Um, and the proposition is to consider stand-up, doing stand-up <laughs> comedy. <laughs> People tell me I'm funny. 
<laughs> and I take that as an insult. But anyway, um, <coughs> yes, it it has given me a perspective on my fa my father. But um, I had the perspective too when I was making the film. I tried to show both sides of what I felt about him. Um, maybe one is a little heavier <laughs> on the on the negative than on the on the positive, but. Um, I did want to be honest about it, and, and um, um, you know, I I, I, I do have, uh, you know, uh, ambivalent feelings. I, I continue to have ambivalent uh, feelings. So I, I don't think life is, I don't think there's any black and white in life. I think it's all grays and, uh, you know, ups and downs. And, and uh, It's not like in the movies. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that answer you? Yeah. Any more questions? There's a, can we get the mic? Throw it at him. <laughs> <laughs> I think those of us uh, who are in a similar age group uh, that have parents who were in the Second World War share a certain um, experience of, uh, I mean, uh, I don't <laughs> It's, it's not a formed question here. <laughs> it's not here yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it was touching to me when uh, when you uh, showed the um, perspective of your father of you, his memories of you. Um, I think the reconciliations that I felt with my father, who also had been in the Second World War and had uh, similar episodes of um, frustration and anger in life and... Mm -hmm. uh, I was probably, well, he died when I was 14, and I was probably 30 around the time that I came to the realization. Um, not looking at the relationship from my point of view, but his view of me. Mm -hmm. And suddenly my perspective of him changed, and my relationship developed again after all of these years. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing my life from his view of me. Mm -hmm. And I saw that in your film when he talked about his memories of helping you with your animation. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was, for me, that was the strongest point yes. in the film where, where uh, um, I c I, for me, I could see where you could suddenly see a conversation from his point and from your point. Yes. A and that was where I saw it. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. That's a wonderful point. And he did help me. And I would ask for these things, and <coughs> uh, there were books and things that I wanted, and my mother and father tried to to get me those as well. Um, in fact, you know, much of the dialogue of my father in this film is from an interview that I did with him, a little kitchen table thing with a small, you know, tape recorder, just talking and asking those questions. Uh, you know, uh, so a lot of the a lot of the dialogue about his early life and things uh, were things I was curious about. But you don't, you know, a lot of people don't ask those questions of their parents. And then you regret it when they're gone, and I didn't want that to happen. I guess I was always thinking in the back of my head, I've done all these films about serious subject matter. I have a story to tell, and I need to get serious about it. So back in, you know, like, I had a dream. The, the whole opening about the turtle, snapping turtles, came from, from a dream. I remember, and I have the drawings of just doing little sketches of what that might look like. I didn't know what it w I was going to do with it, but it had something to do with him. And uh, and then the opportunity came that I could sit and talk to him. He was willing to do it. He wanted to talk about those things as well. Uh, there were a lot of things that weren't said. And there's a, there's a section of the film I wish I had done, which was the meeting of my mother and father. They met at, uh, uh, he was at, at a barber shop, and next door was a beauty shop that my mother worked at, down in Waverly or Sayre, Pennsylvania. And uh, he described it to me in the, in the videotape. He said, oh, she was a beautiful lady, and uh, I was having my hair cut, and she was over there doing so much, and she would look over at me, and I would look over at her, and then she'd do this, and then I'd do this. And <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't I use that, you know? <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> Maybe I can put it into the director's cut or something, you know, <laughs> if there ever is anything like that. So thanks for your question. Uh, do we have more questions? Uh, 
Um, so my question is, what is your um, sort of biggest challenge when it comes to visualizing such um, personal experience or just a story that entails like a bundled amount of um, emotion? Like what's so hard about visualizing it or what's so enjoy about enjoyable about visualizing it? Well, it's just part of the creative process. As, I, as we talked about earlier, it's difficult to begin. Once you begin, though, then it becomes another level of the creative process. At least something is there that you can work on. At least, you know, if you write a few words, you can come back to those and say, that sounds okay, but this should happen, or maybe you change, you start changing things and, and such. In terms of the emotional thing, um, there were times when I would, you know, be drawing something or whatever and, and think, have I told, you know, too much here? Or have I not gone far enough? Or, or maybe I should go further, that sort of thing. And I had encouragement from Peggy and Joe and, and uh, other people who worked on, on the film making suggestions. And then it was up to me to consider whether I wanted to you know, implement them or not. It's, it's a choice thing. And, and other people may have different reactions to it. But it's just a question of diving in. Um, the, the original art and, and such, the development of this took over took, took place over a month at the Bellagio um, Villa in, um, in Italy. Uh, I had won uh, w one of two Rockefeller Foundation grants. And they're, they're marvelous things because you just go over to this fantastic setting on Lake Como and they feed you <laughs> and they give you your own you know, studio, and I had one called Veduta, which was up on a hill somewhere. It was a little stone tower, and I would be in there drawing all day in, uh, in the woods, and, uh, you know, give you a lunch box and all of that stuff. I mean, they're just really taken care of, but there's nothing else to do but the work, which is great, <laughs> you know. You really can focus on it and eat. And uh, so that's where the, the development of this this happened, and I had no, just basically uh, photographs and the transcripts of uh, my, my father's words and all of that sort of thing. And so it was just going from there. And by the end of the month, I had the basic thumbnail sketches of the entire uh, board done. Some things went off on tangents. Those were changed or cut or whatever advice on the part of uh, Peggy. There was a point where I was doing the voice. Talk about performing. I did the voice of the son of me in in this, but then Peggy <laughs> came and fired me. <laughs> says, oh, you're not you're not getting the full emotion in this stuff. So we I agreed and we got this unknown guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's an Italian needed work. <laughs> Totoro is Manuro, I don't know what what his name was. Um, and of course Eli had been there all the all the all the while. He was uh, an amazing actor. He was childlike in the joy that he had for acting. Did you know him? Yeah, he was just, he was, uh, he was great. I remember being so nervous when we had to, at the recording studio, waiting for him to come uh, there, and, and it would be me recording with Eli Wallach, and in comes this, this old guy, and he's just happy to be there, and, and uh, came in, and it was there. I mean, it was just there, and Totoro, the same thing. You know, good actors are worth everything they're they're paid. You know, they they bring so much to the uh, to the project. Gone off there on a tangent, haven't I? Mm -hmm. I'm old. <laughs> so um, I, I appreciate your work very much, and um, Thank you. I just want to uh, say I'm surprised when when you said um, that you went to Marymount College. I did also, and I I had experience with Mother Gunsmith. Oh my also. goodness. I mean, it's just <laughs> such a circle that What happened. year were you a graduate? Well, early 60s. Um, ah. I, I graduated in 70, 74. Yeah. 74. Well, for me, 64. Wasn't she wonderful? Yes, extraordinary. And I'm sure she touched many lives with her. She was tall and sweeping, yes. still wore the habit when I... Um, he was out of the habit her. when she I was out of the <laughs> habit ten years later. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't line. mean that. That's, uh, <laughs> but that's a description. So <laughs> that sounds like a new movie title for you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, the um, 
the emotional power and psychological and depth of these deceivingly simple images mm -hmm. is very profound. Mm -hmm. And the um, <coughs> one thing that I, I'd like to ask is, do you or your students um, ever work with an author? I heard you say Cal uh, the Caldecott. I, I, I didn't quite catch what you said, but um, um, uh, for instance, I have uh, written a, a children's book on climate change with children in various um, scenarios. And uh, I mean, uh, this is selfish in a way of a uh, question. It's general also, but wouldn't it be wonderful to connect with people who have written things like this and do an animation mm -hmm. for it collaboratively? Yeah, I I it would be. It depends on, you know, schedules and all of that sort of thing. But if you're interested in uh, having students perhaps get getting interested in a project like that, um, talk to me afterwards because there's something here in the animation program called SAL, which is Student Animation League. And uh, you write a description of what you're looking for in terms of a collaborator or something uh, in terms of animation. And we will send it out to our mailing list, uh, an emailing list that goes to over 300 uh, current and alum uh, members of, of, uh, the, uh, um, of the club. It's a student-run club here. and. Uh, the students who are interested in the project will contact you, rather than my, you know, suggesting specific uh, students. I think it's please come afterwards. Uh, we'll have a chat about the alum association at Marymount. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have, you have a question? Yeah. Um, so my question, I guess, is a little ill-formed as well, but um, I find that as I get older, so much of my memory is tied to people. And having lost a parent myself, like my memories of childhood are shared with, you know, my sibling, it's like a gatekeeper. So how much of this film and this memory and I guess going through these traumas did you share with your brother, especially when you were, I mean, maybe speaking with him about the idea of bringing this to life? That's a very good question. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, Tony uh, was completely supportive and I brought him into it during the storyboard stage when I got back from Italy and I was up visiting. He, sl he still lives up upstate here. It's a Seneca Lake area, beautiful area. Um, and he has three lovely daughters. One of them is getting married in the fall and so anyway, time goes on. But um, uh, I brought him in, I was nervous and he and his wife watch looked at the board and they, they were okay with the board. And uh, I said, okay, fine. So then, years go by, you know, three years or whatever, and uh, it was time for the premiere, which happened at, uh, at MoMA. And I invited him down and, uh, you know, put him and his wife up in a hotel and all that sort of thing. I didn't know what, you know, because it's different to see. It's, it's almost, you know, to, to show uh, someone not in the business a storyboard. It's a little bit confusing. Oh, yes, uh -huh, is that what's going to happen? Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and, and then uh, <laughs> they're, they're, you know, going on trust. So I didn't know what the reaction was. But Eli was there, and uh, and a whole bunch of friends uh, were there that uh, that evening. And, um, and my brother was in tears, and uh, his wife, too. And, uh, of course, I thanked him from the, from the stage at, uh, at the Oscars. And uh, they were shocked. I mean... They were shocked. There's so many people tell me, we screamed when we heard your name. And then uh, my brother said they flew through the roof when they heard their own name. So <laughs> anyway, so we're still pulling him down from, <laughs> from there. So. But he's, he's been, it's been very cathartic for him because he lived up there for the next 30 years or so. I escaped. I left town and when I was, you know, 18. And... Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, I think we have another question up there. Hi. Um, earlier, um, during this this afternoon, you mentioned um, intergeneration was mentioned. So I'm just curious um, to hear from your perspective and even everyone at um, everyone here about how do you envision younger generation to be engaged in the conversation of the aging. And because um, in my mind, I have so many ideas when I 
um, chat with um, my older grandparents and even um, at nursing homes. So many stories or even recipes that I love doing, um, something that can be engaged um, cross generation. So I wanted to hear from, from your perspective, um, also um, having worked with the students here. Mm -hmm. What is your um, well, I, as I mentioned, I may have mentioned this earlier, I encourage the students to tell their own stories. It's just a suggestion, but I think they know, you know, that would be an intimate thing that would be quite interesting to, uh, uh, to see. Um, I, I, uh, I think that, um, I, I remember one of my earlier students, uh, I said to her, um, why don't you do a film about your grandmother? I knew her, her grandmother. She made wonderful brownies. And uh, I said, why don't you just, she said, I love my grandmother and I'm just so afraid she's going to die. And, and, I, and, this. and I said, well, why don't you make a film about it? You know, then she won't. You know, she'll always be with you. And I said, make it very simple. I mean, I love her brownies. Everybody loves her brownies. Why don't you talk to her and record her telling you how to make the brownies? She never made the film, uh, but you might consider with your grandma, yeah, the, the <laughs> um, you might consider making a film of a family member like that. Um, I think that's the way of, of getting involved with, and you said, you, where do you work that you, you, you hear so many uh, stories? Well, um, I'm actually a dietitian working at a nursing home. Uh-huh, yeah. wow. Do you make films too? I didn't hear the last part. I would love to know how to make films. <laughs> well, you come to the right place. Uh, if I could add just one thing from a, a <laughs> historian perspective, there are filmmakers who also do make films in terms of discovering things about their family, so maybe there are ways to connect. One I think of is Alan Berliner, mm -hmm. who made a film called The Family Album, where he took just people who had, had films in garbage cans and put them together, and it was from life to, uh, to death. Mm -hmm. So he articulated this, but then he also interviewed his father. He interviewed everybody that he could find that had the last name of Berliner. Another one I think is very important is Thomas Allen Harris. He's an African-American filmmaker, and his whole enterprise, from my perspective, is to uncover all these layers about his own identity, being African-American and gay. He made a film about his stepfather who was involved with the African National Congress. He's now made a film, um, uh, it's actually a big project to encourage, uh, he made a film about recapturing the African-American identity through family albums that people have. And then he actually has a project now to go around the country to have people um, find their family albums from an educational perspective. So. I just think in terms of like John and his students and enterprises of certain, these are really independent filmmakers who are working independently, not in the Hollywood system at all. There are people engaged in this process of self-discovery and s identity in a larger context and often dealing with people's memories from photographs and their parents and their grandparents. So there is, I think, a bit of that that's sort of already laid out in terms of films that also one can see and filmmakers who are continuing to do that. Well, here's, I mean, you're asking these questions, and it sounds like you have something where you are now that could be turned into a many different platforms. Um, do you write? Um, I'm writing, but on my own. Well, why don't you consider the subject matter where you're, you know, working and, and try to bring it into the writing, see where that goes. Um, take some courses in filmmaking. We have summer courses in animation here, taught by Zoya Baker. Um, and, you know, you can, if you're really interested in why pass it out to other people, you'd probably enjoy mm -hmm. creating your own books, films, all of that sort of thing. And it's possible. It's absolutely possible. Yes. I think we have time for one more, do we? Or? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just had a, uh, a comment and a quick question for John um, on the mentorship thing. Um, 
just to because you're recording this to expand the record a little bit. When my son first came here, um, one of his mentors was a guy named Rob Marionetti, who was a um, an NYU graduate here, who is very successful in the animation field on his own, who told me a story about how John was one of his great mentors, and which encouraged him to be a mentor also to Aiden. And uh, I, I want to thank John for being so generous to Aiden, because he really made all the difference. And Rob told me that John is just one of the great all-time mentors of all time. And because of that, I was able to become pretty good friends with Glenn Keane, who is a mentor all uh, of unbelievable stature to my son. And his mentor was um, Ollie Johnston. Uh, uh, uh and Frank and Ollie, of course, who you mentioned, these are some of the most generous people I've ever heard of. And can you just speak a little to that? Because you said that, that both Frank and Ollie were mentors to you. These, uh, everyone seems, it, one mentor seems to beget another, seems to beget Because another. we all love animation, and we all want people to love it as well. And uh, um, I think, uh, I think animators are naturally empathetic because there's a there's an animation sensibility about everything. Oh, the poor bottle. It's empty. It's half empty. Oh, how sad. Am I speaking too loud, Mr. Microphone? <laughs> hmm? Are you okay? Are you are Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. The anthropomorphic thing. You put yourselves into the uh, you know, into the the life of all of these objects. That's again something that we really need in government. Now we need <laughs> we, we need people who are empathetic, you know, not cruel. Uh, look what's happening with Chip and and uh, DACA and all of that. I cannot believe this is happening in our country. I don't want to get into this now, but uh, it's it's just uh, a, a question of human empathy, you know. Uh, love thy neighbor, or you know. Treat other people the way you want to be treated, uh, etc. And I think animators have that naturally because we have to become, particularly character animators, have to become uh, the characters. We have to have be actors with a pencil and a pixel, you know. So that's my theory, and I'm sticking with it. So. Joan, you had a question. I had a question, and it disappeared. But I really wanted to thank John and John for agreeing to do this. Because when um, my boss said the university has initiatives, one of them is aging, can you help them? Uh, I didn't know what to do. And Luis came and said, we need to generate interest uh, about this topic, and we need speakers, but we want the younger people to attend. I said, you put aging on screen and nobody will go. <laughs> That's in my head, no offense, because I, I am a grandma, so I'm, I'm, I'm old, I'm, I'm aging. So um, thank you, John, and thank you, John, but I also wanted to um, connect with um, her comment and her question that um, I think this venue, this um, initiative is exactly doing what it's supposed to do because now we're inspiring like if there's one or two people who are now inspired to write something um make a movie create a dance whether they're young or they're old and they publish a book when they're what 73 which we heard from john as an example i think we've done something right already like in a little way so thank you again john and john Thank you, Joan. <laughs> Are we done here? <laughs> <laughs> or I'm, I can talk more, but I, I think we've, we've, we don't want to jump the, s the shark, do we? <laughs> oh, we do. <laughs> I just wanted to make one one comment. It was what you just did, um, <coughs> where every object came to life. Mm -hmm. And there's something, you know, I, I it made me think about what we do with our kids when they're little and how we get very silly with them. 
and how we bring all these, all these objects to come to life. And so what you did was very youthful. And I think that's, that's part of the magic of your work and, and what draws us to, you know, to this, this thing called animation. Thank you. Uh, there was a, one of the first, the person who um, really created personality or character animation was Windsor McKay. And he lived from, um, you know, he, he started doing um, Gertie the Dinosaur in 1914. That's a famous film in animation because it's the first time that a character had a personality that had emotions that an audience could relate to. And McKay was on stage with his creation. This is another fascinating thing for 1914, a multi-platform thing. He's live and his animation is taking orders from him like it's a trained elephant. He'd snap a whip, a literally snap the whip and say, all right, Gertie, raise your right foot. And then she'd hem and haw. She, she was like a little girl trapped in a giant's body. And um, he admonishes her. He says, come on, you're being lazy. And, and then she starts to cry and the audience melts. I mean, this dynamic of having a, a cartoon be more than just something that moves, but something that emotionally moves you was I extraordinary. And it influenced countless other animators, including Walt Disney and many of his, uh, his crew, including Frank and Ollie. And now your son, and uh, oh, it's just never ending. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's exhausting. <laughs> wow, this is really amazing. Um, well, on behalf of the Aging Incubator, we'd like to thank you for your uh, wonderful uh, conversation that you shared with us. And also, the film is certainly uh, fabulous. So I remember I taught a course that actually asks each student actually to interview their grandparents and uh, write a, a, a story and as a part actually find an exam. So now in the future, if I ever teach this kind of course, I certainly will this would be a good example. That certainly that, look, this is a wonderful example for our students to think about how to turn their <laughs> assignment later into potential film or books, et cetera. So anyway, uh, so here we have uh, uh, a gift that our uh, aging incubator prepared. Uh, we'd like to uh, as a token of appreciation. Thank you. Mr. John. Mr. John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very heavy candy. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we uh, would like also uh, we will also like to thank Tish for their hospitality, support, and the and the, the their help with scheduling and the promoting this event. In particular, we'd like to thank Tish Dean, Allison Green, and the Chief of Staff June uh, for facilitating this event. Thank you, um, and Alice for all the room scheduling that needed to be done for us to use this room. Um, uh, Adrena uh, for helping us to set up today uh, today's event and the Cassie Prince and uh, Bonita for helping to promote this event. We thank everyone for attending uh, today's event and I'm sure we have uh, uh, been uh, given a few for uh, re reflection. So next I would like to turn the mic to my colleague uh, Dr. Josh uh, Chodesh to actually we have an exciting announcement to make. Yes. Thank you so much. <coughs> so thanks, Bay. So I'm announcing the winners of the first annual uh, Innovators in Aging Award. And in September of last year, that was just a month ago, I guess, 2017, the incubator launched the first uh, annual Innovators in Aging Award. This is clearly becoming a thing because we just saw an email from the State Department of Health and they want to do it too. And <coughs> we've been on the subject of mentorship and um, we certainly want to thank the faculty and, the ad and administrators throughout NYU, both, both here and abroad. That includes uh, uh, the breadth of, of NYU's institutes and schools that are really too numerous to name who promoted and mentored students to participate in this competition. And students that were both graduate and undergraduate were invited to submit innovative ideas 
or tools or resources that would significantly enhance the lives of older adults. And we received, just in our, in our infancy, we received 20, 27 submissions for, the, for this first award and seven teams participated in the final round. Which, and from these seven finalists, we're very pleased to announce two winners. So for the undergraduate award, we're pleased to announce that the winner is the Accessible Taxi Program, whose goal is to provide older adults with the freedom and dignity by outfitting taxis to best serve their needs and creating a simple and efficient way to hail them. And the team lead for the undergraduate winner, SBS student Walter Stack, was able to attend today's event. I think, Walter, you're here, so come down, please. get hurt. <laughs> we do have a few doctors in the room. <laughs> so Walter, congratulations and Thank and uh, and here's your make sure we have the right one. That's yours. Uh, and thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we look forward to seeing you in the near future. <laughs> so the graduate team winners were Antonio Sariki, doctoral candidate of occupational therapy and Anna Brown, MS candidate in clinical nutrition who I believe are also here today. So come down, please. <laughs> they'll, be, they'll be developing uh, an interactive program that will help older adults maintain mobility and health to ensure their golden years are as fulfilling as their younger years. I'm not sure what I feel about golden years. <laughs> <laughs> so, Antonio? sticky on there so that we don't, <laughs> we don't screw it up. There you go. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, for pictures. <laughs> go for it. Okay. Great. Thank you. So we'll, in the near future, we'll be asking both of this, uh, both of these teams as part of the speaker series to present on their innovations. You didn't know what you were getting into, I don't think. <laughs> At some point this, uh, later this year, and we wish both teams the best, and we're very excited to see how that they progress with helping enhance the lives of older adults. And be, uh, on behalf of the, the NYU Aging Incubator, I want to thank you all for attending today's event. It was just delightful. And we look forward to seeing you at the next speaker series uh, with Tisch faculty, Carlos de Jesus and Nova Scott James. This is on March 7th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the NYU Cantor Film Center. Carlos and Nova will be exploring aging through intergenerational perspectives, and invitations will be sent out for this event, and these are forthcoming, so stay tuned. Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs>